Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as you start coming in, please feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom chat. Um, include your name, organization, and the state you're located in, and we'll get started in just a second. Hi, Lisa. Hello. People in the chat, very fun. Wow. It's so, oh, it's so great to see so many people from across the country. Awesome. So I'm gonna go and get started. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, Oh, let me see if you can see my screen one second. All right. Uh, welcome uh, to Leveraging the Google Ad Grant for your nonprofit. We're so excited to have Jessica King of Getting Attention here for our Mighty Cause webinar expert series. All right, um, for those of you who uh, maybe haven't seen me yet on one of our webinars, my name is Lisa Galbrin. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Mighty Cause. Um, and so before I hand it off to Jessica, uh, I just wanted to kind of go over a little bit about Mighty Cause for those that are maybe not familiar with Mighty Cause, brand new to it. Um, Mighty Cause has been around since 2006. We're a year-round fundraising platform uh, for nonprofits looking to make annual uh, campaigns or peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns. Um, we're also one of the biggest giving day technology providers in the country. We provide the technology for giving days such as Give Minnesota, Colorado Gives, and North Texas Giving Day. So we've been um, around for a while and our goal has always been to create a platform that's simple and easy for nonprofits to utilize for their fundraising. So just a little bit about some things about Mighty Cause. Again, if you're not familiar with who we are, and what we offer. Um, so our platform, as I mentioned, we're all in one. So we have a lot of different tools um, that uh, nonprofits have access to, such as integrations with MailChimp, Constant Contact, uh, Salesforce, Google Analytics, which we'll talk about a little bit um, when uh, I hand the ribs off to Jessica, peer-to-peer uh, -peer fundraising campaigns, analytics, etc. cetera. Um, so just a little bit about Mighty Cause. So now I'm going to hand it off to Jessica. So we're so excited to uh, have Getting Attention here. Jessica King is the business lead at Getting Attention. Uh, she helps nonprofits get the Google um, ad grant and manage it effectively to get the most from it. Prior to her work from um, at Getting Attention, Jessica worked at nonprofits and in higher ed, where she focused on communication and digital marketing. Most recently, she worked in search engine optimization in the mission-driven sector. Uh, so Jessica holds a master's degree in communication from Virginia Tech. And in her free time, you can find her reading, cooking a new recipe, or hanging out with her cats, Benny and Olive. So I'm so excited to introduce Jessica. I'm going to hand it off to you. All right, well, I will go ahead, oh, just lost my window, and share my screen, and then we can get started. So I'm really excited to chat with everybody today, um, just as some kind of housekeeping stuff. If you have questions for me, you can feel free to put those in the chat. Um, I will say it's been a very active chat, so they've been scrolling by, but I want to leave some time to address those at the end. But yeah, I'm really excited to talk about how you can leverage the Google Ad Grant for your nonprofit. So as far as what we're planning to cover today, first of all, I'm going to start with an ad grant overview in case maybe you're not familiar with the program or um, you know are kind of stuck on some of the application steps. These are common questions that I get from nonprofits. Then I want to move into some success tips. So maybe you are joining this call and you're like, we already have it set up, but we don't really know what we should be focusing on. We don't really know how to get the most benefit out of it. Talk about that. And I'll wrap up by just talking about some key takeaways um, that you can kind of carry forward for your organization out of this webinar. So let's start out with a Google Ad Grant overview. So first of all, what even is this Google Ad Grant? What is this program that we are talking about? It is a program from Google that gives eligible nonprofits up to $10,000 per month 
to spend in Google search ads. So um, one way you can think about this, it's not the same. The name grant can be a little misleading, I find, for organizations. So um, grant would sometimes lead people to think that it's like uh, you get a check, right, from Google. It's not quite like that. It's more like you get a uh, credits that you can use in your ads account, or another way you could think of it would be like a gift card that you can spend with Google ads. So what it helps you do is run ads that are relevant to your organization. So as an example, I'm based in Atlanta now. Um, and so I searched the term help stray animals. And I was served at the very top of my search results uh, an ad for the Atlanta Humane Society. So you can see that they have a couple of different things they're calling out. First of all, their telephone number is really big and visible. I could hit that and be connected to them immediately. They also have a couple of other key pages that they are calling out here. So they have their adopt a pet page, they have a donation page, they have their locations and hours, things like that, that really help people um, get involved with your organization really quickly. And you'll notice, and this isn't 100% of the time, but in this particular example, this ad also showed up even before organic results. And since it is deemed by Google to be more relevant than me, the Atlanta Humane Society is not quite as big as the Humane Society of the United States, but the result was shown above. So it's a really cool tool to help you show up with a high degree of visibility in Google search results. And that $10,000 per month budget is pretty generous for most organizations. So it gives you kind of a lot of, a lot of space to play when it comes to search advertising. So that's what the ad grant is. The next question I often get is, what is the best way to use the ad grant? And I think this is a really important question because a place where I see nonprofits get hung up a lot is on whether or not the Google ad grant will drive donations for them. And the answer is it can be used to supplement your fundraising efforts. It is not in and of itself a fundraising tool, but it fits in similar to all the rest of the parts of your marketing engine to promote your organization and to help people understand who you are and why they should support your mission. So really where the Google Ad Grant shines is in growing awareness. That is what it was designed to do. That is where it is best. Ads are very good at bringing people who have previously never heard of you, previously maybe never come to your website before, and bringing them in. So that is where I think most organizations will get the most bang for their buck. Other things you can promote with it. You can use it to support upcoming events. So um, as an example, we'll go back to that Atlanta Humane Society example. If they were doing a clear the shelter event, they could run ads to promote that as an example. It doesn't always have to be mission focused though if you have fundraising events. So let's say the Atlanta Humane Society, and by the way, if anybody from the Atlanta Humane Society is on this call, sorry if I'm totally making stuff up here, but if they were running a 5K, um, if they were having that as like a fundraiser, you could also promote that via your ads. Volunteer recruitment is another really common use case we see for this. So if your organization, as so many nonprofits, is powered by volunteers, this can be a great way to source new people for your pipeline. So um, a really good example of like a type of organization that uh, would typically see a lot of benefit from this would be like, if you are an organization who uh, it's very easy for like high schoolers, college students to get community service hours, things like that. So think, you know, you go and help read to children, things like that. Um, you know, recruiting volunteers is going to be a, a pretty strong use for this. The other thing, which is uh, kind of a twist on this, is I've also seen folks use the Google Ad Grant to promote um, job openings at their nonprofit. So if you are hiring for a new employee at your organization, might be worth checking out for that reason. And then there's a category that I would kind of call growing your donor base. So for our clients that we work with, sometimes this looks like straight up running donation campaigns. And we can source donations from the ad grant. But I think one of the things that the ad grant is also good at is bringing in people who will stay connected in your ecosystem and may be able to be nurtured and kind of go on to donate over time. So we pair these donation goals also with goals like growing your newsletter so that you can stay in touch with people who maybe aren't ready to give the first time that they learn about you, but they're interested enough in your mission and they're interested enough in the work that you're doing to give you their email and stay in touch, things like that. So these are some of the really common uses. This isn't an exhaustive list. So there are certainly uh, a lot of other ones you could examine. And I've seen people use the ad grant for really creative purposes, but these are some of the most common ones that I see. So moving on from uses, 
I also just want to cover really quick for anybody who may be uncertain who is eligible for the Google Ad Grant. And by the way, when I talk about this, I'm primarily talking about US-based organizations. Um, the Google Ad Grant is available in a lot of other countries. So if you are calling in from outside the US, um, double check the requirements in your country. Generally, they're gonna look very similar. So in the US, you have to be a registered 501c3 with a high quality website. And we'll talk about uh, some of how Google determines that in just a little bit. Basically what this means is you have to be registered officially as a charity in your own country. So uh, do with that what, what you will. There are a couple of groups that are not eligible for the Google Ad Grant. So uh, one of them would be schools and educational institutions. Um, so if your uh, web address ends in .edu or maybe k12.us, um, you are likely not eligible for the Google Ad Grant, but Google does have a suite of products, which is Google for Education, that you could look into if you were kind of interested in what sorts of offerings they may have for your type of organization. Governmental entities is another one. So if your URL ends in .gov, pretty good chance that you are not eligible for the Google Ad Grant. And the last one is hospitals or healthcare organizations. And this is one that I like to spend a little bit of extra time on because I think it's a bit of a gray area. Um, I have seen organizations who have healthcare as part of their mission get approved for the Google Ad Grant. So it's not like Google, you know, just like hates health or something like that, right? I think that they are, are trying to avoid, and this is just me speculating, but I think they're trying to avoid specific like funding structures. Um, so if you are an organization where you're like, well, we're registered as a 501c3, we don't really consider ourselves a hospital or like a healthcare organization in the sense that we don't like, you know, hire doctors and see patients and do some of that that sort of thing. But we do have health as part of our advocacy. So um, as an example, we we worked with a client who um, their primary advocacy was sort of promoting wellness among the Navajo people. Um, however, part of that included doing vaccine drives and flu shot clinics and things like that. They were approved for the Google Ad Grant. If you think that there is a chance that you are eligible, there's really no harm to taking a, a few minutes to apply, see what happens. Um, if you are rejected because Google views you as an ineligible organization, they will tell you that. Um, and if you are approved, then you fit into that kind of gray gray area um, where you know I've seen organizations get approved even though a casual viewer might might call them a healthcare organization. So we have talked about the eligibility. We've talked about how to use it. We've talked about what the program is. Now I want to talk about how do you prepare your website? Because remember the uh, eligibility standards are that you are a registered charity and that you have a high quality website. And there's really three components to what Google is looking for when it comes to a high quality website. There is, first of all, your SSL certification. We'll talk about how to check that in just a second. There is organization information. So we'll go into a little more detail about what that means and having mission relevant, unique content, which is like a pretty big umbrella, but we'll try and break down a little bit. Hey, just, Lisa, a, just, yeah. a quick, just a quick, just uh, a quick, a couple of questions in terms of qualifications. Sure. Um, so one question that came in was, what about a nonprofit nursing home? This is a tricky one. This is one where I would probably apply um, and and see what happens. I could honestly see it going either way, and I've seen organizations who would fit the bill that have not been approved. And then I've seen ones that to me seem very similar who have been approved. So that is one that I would I would probably just apply and see how it goes. I wish I had a more firm answer for you than that. Awesome. Another qualify, uh, qualification question was our URL ends in .org, not uh, edu. We are registered as a 501c3. Do we qualify? This is a good question. So if you are officially a, uh, and I want to clarify, I guess, what I mean by the like uh, .org versus um, .edu and things like that. So when I say like, if your organization uh, URL ends in .edu, I mean that as a shorthand. Google itself does not actually care <laughs> whether your whether your domain ends in .org, .com, .what have you. Um, for organizations, so we work with a uh, organization that they basically started in a university. So they started as part of the, uh, as like a, um, an outreach service for the University of Nevada or Nevada, uh, depending on where in the country you're from. And um, they eventually became their own organization. And this was back in the day when TechSoup was still approving the um, Google Ad Grant applications. So 
what we did for them, they were initially rejected because their, um, their application was basically viewed as like them being a department of the university, even though they're no longer part of the university. What we did for them is we helped them get started with TechSoup. Like we basically skipped Google, went straight to Google's verification partner. And I can talk about how that fits into this application picture um, in just a second. But we went to the verification partner, got them cleared up there and then resubmitted the application, and then they were able to be approved successfully. So one thing I might uh, recommend, Google's verification partner for ad grants is no longer TechSoup. It's an organization called Percent. And one thing um, that either, if I can pull it up, maybe in the Q&A section, um, I can drop it in the chat, or um, if there's a, a follow-up email, maybe we can include it there. There is a way to basically look up on Percent, like if your charity is registered. So you could potentially, if you're worried about getting mixed up as like, I, I believe I'm eligible, but I'm worried that Google is not going to view that correctly. You can try registering with their verification partner first with the thought that that will smooth that um, process over. And we've we've seen some good results from that. So I don't know if that helps answer the question, but that's probably where, where I would start. No, that's awesome. Any other questions, Lisa, or am I good to keep going forward? There are a couple other questions, but I think we can, uh you'll answer them in a second so we can um, come back to them if you don't sounds good all right yeah so to to recap where we were at we just mentioned the three things that you need to prepare for your website that's that ssl certification organization information and mission relevant unique content so i want to kick off by talking about ssl certification so that stands for secure sockets layer which is basically techie speak for is data that is put into your website going to be handled securely. Google wants to ensure that if they are promoting a website, if users of Google are seeing your website and they are potentially being asked to donate or provide their email or something like that, that you are managing their data um, in a responsible manner. The good news about this is it is super quick to check if you are using Google Chrome. It's a, a really easy thing to look at. So what you're gonna do, up in the uh, address bar, there will be these this uh, icon. It kind of looks like, I don't know, two lollipops on its side or something like that. You'll click on that. You'll see this uh, little icon, ideally. So this is one of our clients. Ideally, you would see this little lock. It says connection is secure. And if you were to click into that, what it will say is certificate is valid. My experience has been for like 99% of organizations that I've come across, this is not a problem. Um, most web builders sort of default to this in my experience. Um, and uh, like I said, this is not something that is usually a big hurdle. It's very quick to check. If you check this and you see something different, like it says connection is unsecure, that is where you will want to chat with your organization's like IT team or perhaps web developer, whoever is kind of managing your website to make sure you're submitting all the paperwork to get that fixed because that that's important also just so that your organization is not involved in some sort of data breach or, or anything else that might be not great uh, PR. But for most organizations, like I said, this is not usually a big hurdle. Usually this is already done by default. So once we have confirmed with a quick check that our SSL certificate is valid, then what we are going to do is look at our organization information. So what is meant by this term organization information is basically um, how new users can learn more about your organization. So a couple of, there's no hard and fast rules for this, but a couple of good places to start would be your mission and vision statement. So I've pulled an example from one of our clients here. They say, we are a not-for-profit dedicated to educating and raising awareness about adolescent depression, encouraging good mental health, and breaking down the stigma surrounding mental health issues. Great. You understand what they're about, what they do, um, and, and that's a, a good thing to make sure that people can find. Other important things, contact information. So emails that people could reach out to. They could be your staff or they could be alias inboxes. If you have like newsletter at yourorganization.org, things like that. Um, phone numbers, if you have an organization phone number, addresses, if you have a physical address, things like that. Basically things that let people know that like, yes, you are a real organization. Yes, there are real people who are involved in your mission and who are making things happen day to day. And here's how they could learn a little more. And then a really common thing that I see is uh, organizations listing their EIN. So for those of you outside of the US, that's basically your uh, tax identification number. It's, it's one way you can check if a charity is registered. I'm sure other countries have equivalents, but 
Um, in my experience, this is optional. Like I've not seen nonprofits get disapproved for not having it, but it is a nice to have. And it kind of, uh, there are a lot of websites that claim to be for nonprofits, um, where when you actually try to look up the nonprofit, no such organization exists. So it definitely helps build trust with uh, potential donors, potential volunteers, potential supporters, if you have that EIN listed. So like I said, optional, but very much a nice to have in terms of just improving um, your organization's kind of uh, public face. So we've got the two easy ones. We've got the SSL thing down. We've got the organization information on the site. Now I want to dive into unique mission relevant content, because I think this is kind of an ongoing um, endeavor for most organizations and is somewhere where I think uh, organizations can get hung up. Basically, when you are trying to show up on Google, you're trying to show up on the internet, you need to give Google some sort of information to read. So Google is pretty good at reading websites. It's pretty good at understanding um, the keywords that are used. We'll talk in, in a little bit more depth about keywords in just a bit. Um, but it, it's pretty good at, at reading material. But if you don't put enough material out there for Google to read, Google will not know what your organization is about, what sorts of topics your nonprofit is relevant to, things like that. So you want to make sure that you are writing content. In my experience, most frequently, this is blog content. Um, but I've also seen organizations uh, improve sort of their, their results with this by fleshing out existing pages on their site. Um, so you don't have to feel compelled to create new blogs from scratch if you don't have those, even just adding additional content like about your mission as an example. So um, here I've chosen some examples from actually that same client that I mentioned earlier who is a um, who started as a university uh, outreach org. Um, and they have a, a blog titled How to Vote When You're Abroad. So what they do is they help young people access scholarships, et cetera, programs to go study abroad. So this is very relevant to their advocacy. It's very relevant to the audience that they're trying to bring in. And it's it's informative, kind of well-designed content. So it's got some headings that are going to be um, kind of related to this concept. So the concept, if someone is searching how to vote when you're abroad, they're getting some step-by-step -step instructions right here, which is helpful. And it also means that, for example, if someone is searching register to vote or how do I register to vote if I'm abroad, things like that, Google can begin to understand how these concepts might be related to each other. So very clear headings. The other thing that I like that they're doing is they have um, some external links to very um, relevant and like trustworthy sources. So they have a place where you can check if you're registered to vote. They have the uh, application link for submitting absentee ballots, all that good stuff. Other examples of like what you might do here. Um, let's say, let's take that animal shelter example um, again, where you know, you might not, it might not make sense for your organization to have a blog. You know, you might be like, we need all hands on deck helping feed the dogs, take them on walks, make sure that someone is petting the cats. Like we do not have time to be sitting and writing blogs. That's fine. What you might be able to do though, is on certain sections of your website, you might be able to flesh out the content a little bit more, give Google a little bit more to read and kind of help it understand what your organization does to address the problem. So as an example, you might have a page that talks about like a trap neuter release program if you're an animal shelter. That's a great place to include information, not just about, yes, you know, you do trap neuter release and here's where you can uh, call if you find a feral cat or a feral dog that, that needs this. But you could also talk about, hey, here's how many strays we estimate are in our county or state or whatever sort of your, your area is. Um, here's the benefits of this program for the animals that come through here. Here's the benefits for um, the community at large, for the wildlife, things like that. Like there are ways to take your existing pages and just kind of make them a little bit more informative so that people who are landing on the site can basically grow to understand the importance of your mission and why they should support it. All right, moving on ahead, I wanna talk about, you know, why, why does this matter? And I kind of talked about this a little bit already, but the easier you make it for Google to understand what your web pages are about, the better your website is gonna perform 
definitely in paid search, but also in organic search. A common problem, and I, I used to work in organic search, is that like there's simply not enough for Google to read. And if Google like, can't read what's on the site, Google will not show it because it will read other more relevant, more informative sites, and it will show that to the user because Google primarily wants to be helpful to the user. Using best practices for Google are also typically going to improve your user's experience. So I'm sure all of you can probably relate to the experience of like, maybe you're thinking about trying a new restaurant and you're going to their website and you're like, they did not link their menu or their prices anywhere. So I have no concept of what I could order here, no concept of how much it might cost. So I don't really know if I want to go here. And you probably have chosen a, a different place to spend your, you know, eating out money. That's kind of the same thing that, that is going on here. So you may have a lot of people who are very connected to your mission, who, because they are less familiar with your organization and because maybe they can't find enough information on your website, might be turning away and going and seeking out other alternatives when maybe they would have been a really good fit for your organization as a volunteer, as a donor, as a program recipient. Um, so you wanna make sure that you are building out a robust enough website presence that the user can get what they need. Like I said, this is a this is a growth over time type of deal. I don't want to scare anybody on this call right now to be like, oh my God, if I don't have, you know, a 40 entry blog and if I don't have like the Wikipedia, you know, linked to my my homepage that I'm suddenly not going to be able to get the Google ad grant. You definitely can. We just want to make sure that we are continually over time improving the website, making sure it's very informative, adding a lot of content, et cetera, because that's really going to improve your results there. So I promised that we would talk about the application process um, and I am gonna dive into that right now. So I would recommend using a Gmail when you apply for the ad grant. Um, I find that's just easier and you will need a Google account to log in. It's not a requirement, but um, I find it's, it's a helpful step. Um, but ideally you should be using whatever login you are going to want to use for Google for Nonprofits, because the first step is to apply for Google for Nonprofits. So what that looks like is you will fill out a survey. It's fairly short. And Google sends that to their verification partner, which is percent. What percent does is they basically look it over. They double check that you're actually registered, that you're verified with, um, you know, your federal government, whatever that might look like for your country. Um, and then they send Google the thumbs up. Once Google gets a yes from percent, then they say, congratulations, you have been added to Google for Nonprofits and you'll get an email to that end. You'll log in to Google for Nonprofits and you'll see a list of products that are available to you. So um, one of them is Google um, like Workspace. So you can use like Google Docs, you can use Gmail, all that good stuff. One of them, of course, is the ad grant. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you also get access to YouTube for nonprofits since Google owns YouTube. And then uh, the last one, I think, is Google Earth. I haven't quite figured out how one would use Google Earth just yet, but um, it's also in there. What you're going to do is click on the ads logo, and you will be directed to a um, application to get started with the Google ad grant. So what that application looks like, it's fairly straightforward. You're going to list some information about your organization. And by the way, when I'm saying information about your organization, when we're applying for Google for nonprofits, it really should be uh, information that anyone at your organization should know. So it would be like your EIN, your physical address, a contact person of, or a contact information for a person who is um, involved in the organization. That could be you, that could be your executive director, what have you. Um, I We used to do it actually on our client's behalf uh, back in the day, but percent has made that a little bit more challenging. So now we walk through it with our clients instead. Um, but it's, it's, it should not scare you. It's, it's not a test. <laughs> it is simply a, an application form. And then similarly, when you are applying for the Google ad grant, Google's going to ask you a ton of questions about your organization. It's basically going to be like, what sorts of audiences are you trying to reach? What is your ideal marketing spend look like? Um, lots of different just uh, sort of context gathering questions. I do recommend answering these honestly because it will help Google kind of tailor their recommendations to you. Um, but again, it is not a test. There is not necessarily a one right answer kind of thing. There is a brief section that uh, just ensures that you understand Google's policies and make sure that you're, you know, you promise that you're not gonna do anything illegal using the Google Ads platform. But outside of that, it's a fairly straightforward process. You'll submit that. 
And then usually within one to three business days, you should receive a reply from Google Ads, ideally telling you, yeah, you've been accepted and here's the next steps to set it up. If you have been rejected, they will usually tell you why. So um, in my experience, the most common reason to not get the Google Ad Grant is that the website quality is not up to, up to snuff. One that I have seen um, has to do with website load speed. This is one where I would recommend having a couple different members of your team or like a board member who is friendly or something like that. Just check it out. Check it out on a few different devices. And if you're like, I'm not sure what's happening here. It's loading just fine for me. Resubmit it because occasionally it might just be the specific sample size that Google had on that day. We've had we've helped some nonprofits get their ad grant application approved that way. Um, and then the other thing would be if there is not enough content on the website, that's where I would advise you to kind of look at maybe similar organizations or organizations that are maybe like five years ahead of where you would where you find yourself today. So um, as an example, if I'm like, I don't know, puppy rescue. Atlanta. And I apologize if that's a real organization. Maybe I'm looking at the Atlanta Humane Society's website and going, okay, what what pointers can I gr can I grab from there, from this more established organization and, you know, resubmit. What I will say about this ad grant application is it is not like a um, you apply once and then you're banned from the platform forever or anything like that. It's really designed to be fairly easy to acquire. Keeping it is the harder part, but you're not you're not put on some sort of like forbidden list if if you submit an application and it doesn't go through. So that's why when in doubt, I always recommend just submitting the application and seeing what happens. Um, but there's very little harm to reapplying or resubmitting your application for consideration. All right. So I mentioned that it is designed to be fairly easy to get the ad grant. Now you have it. Now let's talk about what it takes to keep the ad grant to continue to be able to run $10,000 worth of ads every month. So first of all, you need to get a 5% click-through rate or CTR per month. What that means is that at least 5% of the people who see your ads needs to click on them. So um, I, that is pretty straightforward there. The other thing you need to get every month is at least one conversion. So with the uh, conversions, what I mean is basically a meaningful action that somebody takes on your website. And you get to specify what that action is. So um, for some organizations, maybe that looks like a donation submitted. For other organizations, maybe that looks like a volunteer sign up. For other organization, maybe it means growing their newsletter subscribers so they can stay in touch with people. Um, I usually recommend actually having a few different conversion actions. Um, this can kind of help you meet that one conversion per month requirement, um, but you need to make sure you're getting at least one. There are also other requirements that may pop up as needed. So as an example, uh, once you start spending a certain amount, Google will ask you to complete advertiser verification, basically just saying, yes, we are really who we say we are. Um, there's an annual survey for advertisers, things like that. So in general, um, the ad grant rules, they are strict. So to give you some context for like 5% CTR, the paid search industry average across like all industries is around two to 3%. So there's a high bar for nonprofits as far as the, the click-through rate goes. Um, and depending on what you set up as your conversion action, conversions can be tricky. If you don't meet these requirements, like let's say you start at the beginning of March, you run your campaigns all through this month and it, it's April 1st and you are a little shy here, it's not like a, you know, one you get one shot at this and then your account is immediately cut off and, and you're thrown out on the street or anything like that. Um, it's more like Google will send you a notification via email basically being like, hey, your account is at risk. Here's the problems that we see and you need to fix this essentially in order to keep your account running. So I would recommend, like I said, playing around here. The other thing that can happen is um, if you're not able to meet these requirements and your account does get deactivated, if it's something that your organization has more capacity to do later on, and I see this a lot with organizations where maybe they had one staff member back in like 2017 who was really into it and who, who ran the campaigns and then that staff member left and then they just kind of let it fizzle for three years and now they're ready to get it back online, um, you can reactivate a grant that has lapsed. So again, it's not really designed to be like a punitive program, but Google wants to make sure if they are giving you free money to advertise that you are doing so in a high quality way 
and that you are taking advantage of it and not just sort of putting it on autopilot and doing other things. So that is my big sort of masterclass on the basics of the Google Ad Grant. Now I want to talk a little bit about some success tips or sort of what you should be keeping an eye on um, and how you should be evaluating kind of the different parts of your ad grant account to be successful. And the first thing I want to start with is keywords. So when I say keywords, what I mean are terms that people put into Google and hit enter to search. So a keyword can be one word or it could be 15 words for the chatty amongst us. Um, what you are wanting to look for, and by the way, for this, um, there's a couple different tools you could use. You could use um, some of Google's free um, native tools. So uh, Google Keyword Planner would be the one that exists within Google Ads. You can also use, there are a, a number of different um, keyword tools that have free tiers. So SEMrush would be one, Moz would be another one. Moz tends to be pretty um, beginner friendly, but it doesn't have paid search keywords. So that is one limitation of it. Um, you could also look at spy food. There's like a few different ones. Um, and so when you're in one of these tools, the keyword metrics you should be looking to evaluate. First one is volume. This refers to how many people are searching for this term per month. Um, this is an average usually that's taken over the year. So that's just something to keep in mind if you are an organization that has seasonal fluctuations. So maybe if you're an outdoors organization, you're oriented towards the school year, things like that. Just know that like if it says 800 searches per month, what it may really mean is there's 1600 searches per month in you know uh, September and there's 200 searches per month in June, um, things like that. But generally speaking, higher volume, usually going to be a better bet purely because, you know, you want to show up on terms that people are searching for. That said, and I'll, you'll hear me say this a few different times, metrics are not always useful in isolation. No single one of these metrics or these um, sort of checks is going to give you the whole picture if you just think about it by itself. So in addition to volume, you also want to be thinking about competition, which is how many other advertisers are trying to show up on this same term. Generally speaking, if you have like a one or two word keyword with a huge search volume behind it, you can bet that there are going to be a lot of people who want to show up for that term. So what you might look at is like, okay, how realistic is it for us to show up on this? If it's a really, really competitive term and you are a very little known organization, that might not be as realistic for you. You might look for what are called longer tail keywords. So like as an example, if we were to search puppies, there are a ton of people are gonna search that, right? Um, there might be a lot of competition to show up on that. So you can think of, you know, not just maybe your animal shelters who have puppies you could adopt, but also like PetSmart, um, your pet food brands, as an example, may also wanna show up on those terms. So you might struggle to compete there. What you might do instead would be like puppies for adoption near me. That's going to be people who are very much looking for what you can provide, and it's going to be a lot less competitive, and you get kind of the advantage of that tailored local element of it. So volume, competition, cost would be the other thing. A really common, um, I won't say misconception because it is a true rule, it's just very easy to work around, is that um, the Google Ad Grant caps your bids at $2 per click, meaning um, that Google says, in order to show up for this keyword, we're charging you $2. I'll talk about what the how the Ad Grant auction works in just a second, so don't, don't get too hung up there, stay with me. But basically, the higher the competition and the higher the volume, typically, the higher the cost is going to go. I wouldn't steer away from terms that generally cost more than $2 per click because if you use a the proper bid strategy that uses machine learning, so this is maximized conversions for any of you ads people out there, you can get around that, that $2 bid cap. So, um, But the cost is something that you want to think about because you are capped at that $10,000 per month. So if you have a choice between two keywords, which are both well-searched, they're both like not, not overly competitive, and maybe one costs $10 per click, and the other one costs $5 per click, you're going to be able to spend that ad grant money getting more people to your website with that $5 per click one. So again, cost doesn't tell the whole story, but it's something to consider. 
The last one, and there is not an easy number to assign to this, unfortunately, is relevance to your organization. When we talk about the ad auction in just a second, I'm going to kind of explain why, why this is important. But a common mistake I will see organizations that are very new to search engine marketing doing is being like, what's the highest searched like term we can get on? It might not have that much to do with our organization, but we're going to go for it. And the problem is Google is a little smarter than that. It, that sort of strategy actually used to work way back in the early days of uh, the, the internet, early days of blog writing, things like that. But today Google is getting pretty smart at looking at your entire web domain, looking at how it relates to other websites, looking at the language that's on your site, et cetera. So what you're going to get better results from doing is making sure that the keywords that you pick are relevant to your organization. So like to go back to that animal shelter example, you know, you probably are going to go after terms like, you know, cats for adoption, kittens for adoption, puppies for adoption, dogs for adoption, and those are all probably going to be relevant. You could run an ad for the term like best dog food brand, and you might show up, but it's not very likely to be very relevant to your organization. Um, and Google will likely be able to see that versus, let's say, PetSmart, maybe they have a... Uh, you know, maybe they have a blog article talking about their favorite pet food brands or what have you. You want to make sure that what you are putting in your account is actually relevant to your organization because you are going to get much better results that way. Even if it seems like if you could just force the system to do something it is not programmed to do, you would get good results. That's not typically how it shakes out. So I've been hinting at this a lot. How does Google decide what ads to show. I think understanding how the ad auction works is going to also be helpful, especially for those of you on this call who may have dipped your feet into ads before, but may not be super, super familiar with it. So basically the way that Google works is that every time someone enters a search query or any time that somebody is um, basically presented with the opportunity for an ad to show. Google does a really, really fast auction to decide who and what it is going to show and in what position. So the things that it is taking into account include your ad quality, the relevance of your ad to whatever's going on, the competition, so who else is trying to show up, and your bid. So what this means is that Google kind of takes a look at the entire advertising picture, picks an ad or two to show in this context. So let's say I searched dogs for adoption. What Google is going to look at is, first of all, what is the quality of my ad? Does my ad text say things like, if you're looking to adopt your next furry friend, click here. We have small dogs, large dogs, medium dogs, like, right? All of this that very much very closely ties to what we know the user means when they search for that keyword. That's uh, the quality. Do you have like links where people could learn more? Does it go to a solid page on the website where people can learn more? And these are also, this is also very closely tied to that relevance thing we keep coming back to, right? The other thing is who else is trying to show up on this uh, keyword? Generally speaking, the lower the competition, the better price you're going to get for it. So that bid, you can think of it like a silent auction, right? Or like a, maybe not a silent auction, actually, maybe you can think of it like a regular old auction that any of us would think of. If you've got Google up on the auction block going, I see two, do I see 250? Do I see 250? If somebody else is bidding 250, there is a chance not set in stone, but there is a chance that they might show up instead. That's why we recommend that maximized conversion strategy because it kind of lets the machine argue with itself for you on your behalf. The other thing that is relevant here is your bid price is sort of affected by all of these other things, which means the more relevant your landing pages and the better quality your ads are, the more likely your ad is to be shown at a lower price because Google taking into account all of these things will determine that it is the ad that users are most likely to see, find beneficial, and like want to engage with. So these are all of the different things that Google is weighing when they are deciding how to show ads. So I want to take a pause here because I know we have a raised hand. Um, yes, we before have we, of, yeah, yeah. we have a ton of questions. This is really um, technical stuff. So yeah, yes. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. So, and don't worry, we'll, we'll get through all the questions, but I'll just, for now, just, um, uh, give a couple. Um, so just to talk a little bit about, 
um, the price range. How do you choose yeah. a price range? Um, and uh, yeah. That's a great question. So um, we're gonna, for this, we're gonna really stick with the ad grant um, sort of ecosystem because, you know, in addition to the ad grant, you can also run a regular paid campaign. And then the question is like, well, what's your budget? And the question in the ad grant as well is really, what's your budget? It is $10,000, we know that. So what I would recommend, usually what you're gonna wanna look for is it's usually healthy to have a good roster of keywords in your account. In my experience, I think if you can hit the sweet spot, this is one advantage to using Keyword Planner as your keyword research tool because it will show you a lower end of the bid. So for the advertisers who get this ad slot really cheaply, what's the lowest that they're paying? And then it'll show you the upper end of the bid. So for the advertisers who get this ad slot and they are paying a handsome fee to show up on this term, what are they getting? Generally speaking, I think a sweet spot for a lot of ad grant terms. And again, it's going to be really mission specific. So you will want to look around, do some keyword research on your own relevant keywords, because this will this will vary based on a few factors. But I think typically, if you can look on the lower end, if you're looking at a couple of cents, like sometimes it's like 18 cents, 30 cents, something like that, all the way to maybe five or six bucks, that's a reasonable place to start. Um, that's going to mean if you were to show up and get lots and lots of clicks that you could potentially get up to, you know, let's take five, 10,000 divided by five, that's like 2000 people, right? That can be brought into your site at that upper end. And then at that lower end, you're um, gonna be looking at a lot more people than that. So that is sort of how you begin to figure out what a good price range is. I think until you have, until you are at the point where you are spending that full $10,000, I really would not recommend most organizations get too caught up on the bids. I would recommend, recommend using the maximize conversions strategy letting the computer set the bid. And then when you are at the point where you're like, we are spending this full $10,000 and now we're trying to refine what we're doing. That's when it might make sense to do the deep dives on like, okay, here's different variations on the keywords. Here's how we might be able to show up more affordably and get that, um, get that efficiency of spend up. Um, so I, I, yeah, like I said, I think a couple cents to $5 is like a good range if you want numbers to hold on to, but it is going to be really specific to your kind of advocacy area. Awesome. Um, so how, how do you find the volume of a keyword? How many keywords should you use? Mm -hmm. That's a great question too. So I think one way to start or what I would, this is usually how I would start when I am working with when I was working with SEO clients and when I was working with paid ad clients, I would start by just sitting with your team and brainstorming the maybe 10 to 20, I would call them like, um, in the business, we would refer to these as seed keywords, but like the short one to two word, like phrases that have to do most closely with your organization. So like, I'll take that animal shelter example. It might be like um, animal shelter. Some of them might be branded keywords depending on what people are looking for. So humane society might be one, um, you know, pet rescue, adopt a dog, adopt a cat, adopt, don't shop, like things like that. Like I would just start before you look at any metrics, brainstorm those. Once you have that solid list, like I said, I do like uh, Google um, Keyword Planner for this purpose because it will let you put in up to 10 keywords and then it will suggest tons of variations for you. And then you can sort of sort those by, you can sort them by a number of different things. You can sort them by volume. So if you're looking for the highest volume ones, you could do that. You can sort it by competitiveness or, or sort of how much other advertisers are trying to show up. So if you're like, I really want to get on those low volume or low competitiveness keywords, you can get there. You can also sort it by price. So if you are trying to improve the spend in your account, you can kind of sort it that way. But I think usually starting from a list of like five to maybe max 20, just to start out with, like just brainstorm them, look at those. And then when you're building out your keyword list from there, what you're going to be looking for, you know, it, It'll vary a little bit by campaign, from campaign to campaign, just depending on the type of campaign you're trying to run, et cetera. But I think for most folks, there's a, there's a strong temptation to put every single keyword under the sun in your account. 
and you're going to get minimal returns from that. So I think if you're kind of looking for like, where might I consider limiting myself just to make sure that my campaigns don't grow past my ability to manage them? 50 keywords is probably a pretty reasonable place to start. That's going to give you some good coverage. Um, you're going to have enough that you're going to begin to get some data in. And I would really use the data that you get into your account to guide the next things you do. So like, as an example, let's take that, um, let's take those animal shelter keywords as an example. Maybe you have really great click-through rates on adopt, don't shop, adopt a cat, adopt a dog, but you find that you are not getting a ton of clicks on pet rescue for whatever reason. You might look at some of the variations and say, okay, like, is it possible that this adopt keyword is really important for our organization or that Google can pick up that term on our website more, which is why we're showing more for those types of ads. Like that's where you can start to, um, you know, pick apart the puzzle piece of how your website is being viewed, how people are finding your website, and then start to cater your strategies either to accentuate that if you're happy with the way that people are finding your website or to slowly shift that over time if you're not feeling like you're showing up on things that are relevant to you. Awesome. Um, and we had a couple of questions from um, some from nonprofits who were rejected or they became mm. deactivated. Uh, what are your recommendations in terms of reapplying or what to do if you've been denied? Yeah. So for organizations who have been denied, and this is hard for me to give like a broad sweeping answer because sometimes it depends on why you were denied. Um, the first thing I would do is look at the rejection email that you got because there will usually be a like reason that was given why. Now I will say that sometimes the reply is not um, not super informative in all honesty. So sometimes they will word it in a way that you're like, that doesn't give me any kind of uh, next steps here. Um, I have seen organizations have some success with reaching out to Google support. So you could try and just say, hey, like, can you clarify this? Can you give me some more context? If this was a relatively recent rejection, this will probably work better than if you got rejected like four years ago, it might just be worth reapplying. Um, for ones that were rejected for website quality reasons, what I would recommend is really taking a close look at your website, look at every single page, kind of, is it working? Is it not? How much content is on the page? You know, a test that I like for nonprofits to do is like, if you have, let's say a um, friend who like is not very familiar with your nonprofit or, um, you know, you can maybe your parents or something like that, like somebody who is maybe not familiar with the day to day, have them look at the website and be like, does this make sense to you? Can you use it? Like, where are you getting stuck? Because these might be the same places. Um, I would check there. If you are using one of the um, search tools that I talked about, so Moz, SEMrush, um, SpyFu, I know for sure that Moz and SEMrush do, not 100% sure about SpyFu, but they have um, some optimization tools that can basically gauge like, how technically up to par is your website? So is it working properly? Are there lots of like 404 errors? If there's lots of broken links, things like that, Google doesn't consider those to be a very good uh, user experience. So fixing those can help. With load speeds, this is something where honestly, I think a web developer is probably gonna be your best, uh, your best friend, but things like making sure that your image file sizes aren't completely huge um, can also help with helping the page to load better. Those are the most common reasons for rejection. The reasons outside of that, like if they have to do with org status, things like that, you know, making sure you're registered properly with your government in whatever capacity that looks like for your charitable organization is a big one. Um, but outside of that, if Google, like I said earlier, if Google doesn't believe that you are an eligible organization, you can try um, submitting a, uh, you can try getting in touch with percent and seeing if that fixes things. Sometimes they will get in touch with you and ask a few more questions about your organization. That might be one way to get through. And like I said, we can send the uh, link um, in some capacity so that folks can, can look around in their charity database. But outside of that, I will admit if, if Google for whatever reason has simply determined you're not eligible, there's not always a ton from the like, organization status like standpoint that you can do but your website is very much in your control 
if you had yeah. an ad grant that lapsed, um, the one thing that you can do usually to get this uh, back on track, what you'll do is um, there when you log into the ad grant account, there's usually an option to say like reactivate account or like uh, submit for appeal. And usually what Google asks you to do is build a campaign that adheres to Google ad grant standards. Um, and then once you confirm that you've done that, they'll take a look at it. Once it looks good, they'll bring it back online. So actually that is usually a fairly fast fix. Um, as long as the reason that it was rejected was basically that the campaigns weren't up to par. If there was a different reason, like if you were breaking the law with using Google ads, there may be no way to get the account back online. But I would guess that that is probably not the most common problem that most people here would experience. Awesome. I know we're coming to time and um, don't worry everyone. First of all, this webinar, a recording will be sent out to everyone. Um, if Jessica's available, we'll try to stick around and help answer more questions. But um, we'll try to, you know, answer everyone. Yeah. I can just skip ahead a little bit to the four key ad metrics to watch, because I think this is another thing where, um, it would be beneficial for organizations to kind of hear about this. And then I think this might be my last slide. Uh, there's two more. Um, so for ad metrics to watch, first of all, that click-through rate is going to be really important. The great news about that is that Google shows you your click-through rate. It's like one of the core metrics usually that pops up in your ads um, just campaign overview screen. Click-through rate is important, but it doesn't tell the whole story, as with any of these metrics. Clicks is another one. That is exactly what it sounds like, how many people showed up at your website. Clicks and click-through rate obviously are related, but there can be um, situations where maybe one, one metric is not always moving in conjunction with another. So sometimes your clicks are going to go up and your click-through rate has gone up. And that probably just means that your ads are being seen more and your engagement you know, continues to grow. But there might be situations where your clicks are dropping, but your click-through rate has improved, which might mean that your ad is being shown to fewer people overall, but it's being shown to a better audience that is more interested in what you have to say. Um, so, you know, keeping an eye on all of these metrics kind of in conjunction can help you kind of piece together what, what might be going on. Conversions is another one. Ideally, we want to see that number going up. I would say for all of these numbers, it's very safe to say that like the best direction for them to be going is up, but there are um, times when them going down might be a good thing. So with conversions, again, we want this to be going up. An example of when we might want certain conversions to go down might be, let's say we were running some conversions to a um, page and we set it up like we we want we are we're going to count a view of this page as a conversion. Uh, you might over time filter that out. In my opinion, that's probably not one of the most useful conversions you could be setting up on your site. So you might over time shift that. So you would be looking for if that overall conversions number is dropping, but the number of conversions on the thing that's most relevant to you is going up, then we would consider that a win. And then last thing, of course, is that total ad spend. So this is a common question that I get, which is like, oh, it's kind of, there's a few questions in here, really. One is $10,000 necessary? Is it a good amount of money? Is it a bad amount of money? How much of the ad grant should a normal organization spend? Um, and then like, is something going wrong if we're not spending that full 10K? The answer to that is like, $10,000 for most organizations is extremely generous. It is not uncommon for organizations, especially if they're just working on this on their own, to not spend that full 10K. Um, and if you have your account dialed in on the things that matter most, it is possible that all your other metrics will look great and that total ad spend will cap out at around six, seven K, five K, just depending on the size of your organization, depending on like where you are, so local, smaller organizations, think like your county church, who is just sort of targeting maybe a 10 to 20 mile radius compared to like uh, the Red Cross, <laughs> who is going to be targeting the whole US, if not the whole world. Um, you know, that's that's going to present very different pictures for ad spend. So one of the reasons that I recommend that people look at all of these metrics in conjunction is that the time to be concerned about if you're getting enough value out of your ad spend would be if you're not seeing a lot of results or not seeing much improvement in these other things. So maybe your clicks are pretty low, only getting a handful of visitors to the site per month. 
your conversions are low or non-existent. Maybe you're only getting one conversion in a month um, for something that's generally speaking a pretty achievable conversion like an email sign up. Um, maybe your click-through rate is like, it's at 5%, but it's certainly never gone over. That's when you might want to be concerned about your total ad spend. But if you, especially if you are a smaller organization or if you're a very locally focused organization, not spending that full 10K doesn't necessarily mean that your ad grant is like not working or that you're doing something wrong. It may just mean that the sort of potential reachable audience is more limited than other accounts. So that is sort of my my spiel on ad metrics. Lisa, do we want to dive back into questions and see if there is more? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, let me take a look. Um, um, so uh, once an organization gets a grant, does it have to be activated with this, within a certain period of time or... Uh if it isn't activated immediately or within a few weeks, does it get taken away? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, that is a really good question. And uh, one that I should probably actually talk about more because yes, the links to activate the grant do expire. So if you are gonna apply for the grant, um, at the very least, set up the ads interface. Basically what will happen is you'll get two emails. You'll get one that says set up billing. That's really a formality. You'll click through and it'll say, we don't bill you, happy advertising. And so you'll click out of that, but you've checked the box. And then there'll be one that says like, set up your ads account. You'll click on that and you will get taken to the ads interface. You do need to click on those two links. Um, in my experience, within two weeks is usually good. I would recommend doing it kind of as soon as you see the emails, just so that they don't get forgotten. Um, but yeah, you do want to set those up right away. Um, the ad grant does not get taken away exactly if you don't set it up, but it is a whole pain to reach out to Google support and get them to send you a new activation um, code. I will let you know that in terms of like Google's priorities, the ad grant is fairly low. So it takes a long time for Google support to get back in touch with you when, um, when you need a new link sent. Um, so for just the sanity of everyone on this call, I would really recommend as soon as you get approved go ahead and set that up um, because no, the like the ad grant approval won't get taken away, but the link will expire and it's a pain to get a new one. I know we're at time. Um, I'll, if Jessica, if you're still available. Uh, I can hang on couple... another five okay. minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. We'll, we'll answer a couple more minutes for five, um, for five minutes. Um, but again, this will be sent out uh in a follow-up email recording of this webinar. Um, so one of the questions was, does Google provide reporting on your ad, like an e-blast, e how many uh, clicked views, et cetera? Um, I was thinking I could uh, help answer this um, regarding Google Analytics. Um, so yes, uh, if you haven't done so already for your nonprofit, highly recommend setting up a Google Analytics account. It is completely free and you can connect your Google Analytics account to um, your website and as well as um, your Mighty Cause fundraising page if you utilize Mighty Cause. Um, so we have a direct integration with Mighty Cause, I mean, with Google Analytics. Um, so what that means is that um, you can then track what your users on your site, um, how they're interacting with your website. So where are they coming from, their location, what, what type of device that they're using. Um, you can gain information like data information in terms of where your donors are coming from. And also, are they actually becoming donors? Is someone coming onto your website? and not making a donation. Um, so again, if you are interested in that, you can reach out to our team in terms of um, seeing how that get, can get set up. But yes, um, you can also connect your Google ad grant to a Google Analytics account and track all of that. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. I think okay. um, in terms of what Google ads will like inherently show you, in my experience, you get lots of um, you get like lots of ad policy updates and things like that from Google, but it does not send you from from the ads interface on its own. It does not send you like a monthly report. It is possible to set that up. Um, to be honest, I do tend to think that either Google Analytics or uh, Google Data Google Data Studio, now known as Looker Studio, is a slightly like it's a little work to set it up, but it's a little bit more user-friendly once it is set up um, platform for reporting. So honestly, I would probably prefer that. But if you, one thing you can do in ads, there will be 
uh, I wish I had an anonymized version of this that I could show, but um, we there's basically like a colorful bar that is at the top of the campaigns overview. So you can set the date range to like, let's say the last month. And you can just have, if you know what your KPIs are, like, you know, you're going to check CTR, clicks, ad spend, and um, conversions. You can just set it so that those four are like always pinned in this colorful bar and it'll just show you and then as you update the date range it'll update it so you could also just make it a habit to check once a month on those things um, and get the information that way but if you're looking for it to get sent to you i think analytics is probably the better tool um and i think um i know we have a ton of questions and, and unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to every one of them but uh jessica's provided her contact information but i think this is a good question to and things onward, what are some of the common mistakes that nonprofits might encounter when setting up a Google ad grant? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think uh, one thing that I wanted to chat about, we kind of ran out of time for today, um, but yeah. is structuring your campaigns. Because what I will sometimes see is either nonprofits make a campaign for everything or they shove everything into one campaign because they don't want to have to deal with multiple campaigns. What campaigns do is sort of tell Google like how to segment these concepts and segment these ads. So there's a few different ways that you could organize campaigns and different marketers are going to have different approaches. So I'm not here to sort of tell you the one one size fits all approach. But the more that your campaigns are specific and it can increase their relevance, the better. You want to keep your intent very specific um, because it improves Google's understanding of what the campaign is about. So as an example, this is a uh, snapshot of the campaigns we're running for a client who is a literacy-based nonprofit. So they try and make sure that kids have books to read. So they have one campaign. This is a dynamic search ads campaign. That is a whole nother can of worms. So just... Feel free to ignore this, but that's one that we will often run for our clients. You can see they have one for Read Across America Day. That's a very specific event. If you know anything about the childhood literacy space or if you've ever gone to a US public school, probably you experienced Read Across America Day. So um, that was one that we are running, but this is like, it's separated out in part because we want to kind of corral the keywords over here and in part so that it's, you know, it was running at the moment I took this screenshot, but eventually we will pause this because it's a seasonal campaign, right? We have other ones that are going to be ongoing. So we have some brand awareness or branded campaigns. So things that have to do with the nonprofit's name, with their mission, things like that. Certain programs. So they have like a send free books to kids programs. They have other programs that are oriented towards educators, like things like that. And then they have a, a donation campaign. And then there's a couple of different ways that folks can uh, participate in that. But what we've done is basically for people who are looking to engage because they are interested in implementing some of the free books for their classroom, let's say, we've got ads that are set to target that audience, that kind of way of participating. And then people who are looking to donate, there may be some overlap in those audiences, but the intent there is going to be a bit different. So we have them separated. Um, and then folks who are looking for these sort of broader literacy terms, broader concepts related to improving childhood literacy, they may end up in this brand campaign or they may fall into some of these other ones, but it kind of helps us target these audiences a little bit better. So I would say as a, as a first pass, don't shove all your campaigns into one and don't, you don't need to feel the need to make a hundred different campaigns for every possible way that somebody could interact with your organization. But that is sort of what I would recommend there. Awesome. All right. Uh, we're definitely at time. Thank you so much for everyone who's attended. Uh, so many questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone. Um, as I mentioned, we'll send a recording and this slide deck uh, in a follow-up email. It has Jessica's contact information. So if you have any other questions about Google Grants, um, her contact information is there. And as well, if you have any questions about Mighty Cause, you can also feel free to reach out to us. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Jessica. I think this was super insightful. Um, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks.